Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast. I have such an incredible guest here today, Shana Sapi. I think that's how you pronounce her last yeah. name. <laughs> cool, perfect. Didn't want to butcher that. Um, which is such an amazing soul. We actually just um, met each other earlier this year when I attended your self love event at Center of You, which was such a powerful transformative night for me then we kept connected we've caught up multiple times i'm so intrigued in what you do shana and how you help people in such a holistic way we have amazing conversations so i knew that i needed to get you on the podcast to talk all about this and especially this year i feel like i've been diving so much deeper into health and learning so much but i need to go straight to the expert to get the the real deal of what is health. You know, there's so many different things going around um, and actually getting to the core of it. So Shana, I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, first of all. And I knew at that event, at that self-love event, when we met that we would just vibe as friends. So it's such a pleasure to be connected and now to be here chatting with you and bringing one of our conversations live on air. Um, so to introduce myself, I'm a nutritionist and an embodiment coach, and I've been going through this phase of trying to find the right word of exactly what I do and how to encompass that, because I feel like health is so encompassing, so many different areas, and we'll dive into that today and more of what that looks like. But I was really trying to find that right word, and I feel like for me, embodiment coach really encapsulates it because it's got the fact that we're actually embodying health rather than just intellectually knowing what we need to do um, or occasionally doing the things but not fully feeling healthy I feel like that embodiment of health is just a whole nother layer of health and that's why I really love supporting people in feeling their best and ultimately I'm on a mission to help people be their happiest and healthiest and I feel like they're very interlinked and health obviously plays a big part in the rest of our life I always like to say that if we don't have our health there's not a lot that we do have because it all starts with our health and how we feel so I'm so passionate about supporting people in just feeling their best and knowing that they deserve to feel amazing. Yes, health is just so fundamental to your quality of life. Like I know that since experiencing, you know, chronic illness when I was younger and dropping out of school and and barely being able to get out of bed and just experience life, it's like your whole world just comes to a standstill and you realize how much you took it for granted until you get sick and you realize like you need to just treasure and appreciate your body so much and I love what you talked about the embodiment because that's kind of what I teach in that like health or wealth or whatever it is is a state of being and in order to achieve that you don't work your way towards it's the identity of like if I'm a healthy person then how would I show up and the actions would be different rather than trying to work towards health so we'll dive deeper into that but I want to hear about your story and how you came to be a nutritionist and that whole journey and then becoming um, a nutrition coach and embodiment coach Yeah. So this is actually quite a funny story. And it's almost like I've lived two lives. Like there was that part of my life where I was very much a party girl. um, And this is how the nutrition journey actually started. I was at a music festival one New Year's Eve. And one of my friends decided she wanted to go vegetarian for a month. And I had kind of just always eaten what I'd been fed by my parents and never really got that experimental in the kitchen. Wasn't a great cook. I could cook the basics, but I never really thought about the food I put into my body and when my friend was like yeah I'm going to go vegetarian for a month I was like yeah I'll join you I don't have a new year's resolution so I decided to go vegetarian randomly off a whim and then I started getting all these questions from people like where are you going to get your protein where are you going to get your iron where are you going to get these vitamins and minerals and I was like what are these things I haven't been taught this like I was like I don't know great question let me find out so I started researching into food and like I was starting to experiment with more meals and recipes because obviously it was a change in diet at the time Um, So I was looking up vegetarian recipes and learning about all the different benefits of different types of foods. And it just led me down this rabbit hole. And I became so excited by everything that I was learning and so like mind blown that we aren't just taught this, that we aren't taught like how to nourish our body and feel good and which foods we need for different things to thrive. So I just like kept reading up on it. And I was like, what we are taught. 
the food well, pyramid bullshit. Yes. Oh my god, when you started on the food pyramid. <laughs> it's like how to be unhealthy, follow the food pyramid. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much flip that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I was like reading textbooks in my spare time. And at that time I was studying marketing, but I was also like in a kind of transition phase where I was like, I love business, I love marketing, but I wasn't loving that course and it didn't feel mm-hmm. aligned, but I also didn't know what to do. So I had taken a year off that year that I had gone vegetarian for that month, which ended up being eight years as a vegetarian. I now eat meat wow, again. that's <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, so it kind of like led me deeper into this health wormhole and just finding all of this information. And then when I was having that year off and I did my travel and I came back and was deciding whether or not to go back to business and marketing, I was actually like, why not study nutrition? Or at the time I was thinking of studying naturopathy because I'm reading textbooks in my spare time. Why not actually (laughs) study this and make this a career? Get a qualification (laughs) for all the work you do. Exactly. (laughs) And actually be pointed in the right direction of which textbooks to read and like just Mm. be able to absorb it better because I'm a very like visual learner. So as much as I can learn from reading textbooks and books and all of that, I also love being able to hear it and being able to practice it and being able to give advice. So I changed my studies and started studying naturopathy, but then changed into nutrition because my plan was to do both. I was going to finish my nutrition, start practicing as a clinical nutritionist and then finish naturopathy. Um, But then I finished my nutrition degree and I decided I actually just loved the food element. I love the herbs and maybe one day I'll go back to do the herbs, but I feel like I kind of found my sweet spot and really just fell in love with supporting people with their food choices, but also with their overall holistic health because food is one piece of the health puzzle. It's an important piece, but it's not everything. So I also just kept reading, kept learning, kept studying all these other health topics Um, And that's why I really come at it from that holistic and embodied perspective, because, yeah, I feel like I've got so much knowledge and so much expertise and so much experience supporting people through their health journey that I just wanted to bring it all together. So that's kind of how it started back in my party days at a music festival. But now I lead a very different lifestyle. So it's cool to see that journey. Yeah, that's such an interesting journey. It's just like you're following all of the signs that the universe is giving you, leading you into that direction and just like following those like breadcrumbs of passion, right? And then just births and turns into something else. And I feel like we just need so many people like you where you're really taking that like full holistic approach and looking at all the different angles and all the different factors that contribute to health and well-being because it's not just the food it's not just the exercise it's also the trauma work the embodiment work the mindset like all of it and um it's very similar to how I got into it. I feel like you know so often we have to like almost go too far into the other end before yeah. we come to balance and like I was the same. I went vegan overnight and then was like a strict vegan for five years. But I will say, I think that was also a bit of like orthorexia, like almost another like version of my restrictive eating, convincing myself that it's like healthy. And I feel like that's something I also want to talk about later on as well. And then now I've come into balance. I, I, I now eat meat, but it's interesting how our journeys just like, you know, go there own ways. So the first thing that I want to start with is a big question, but what does a healthy diet really look like? Like there is so much information out there. And this year I said to the universe, I want to learn more about health. And then it just led me to down all these holes. Like before, you know, I was vegan, you're vegetarian. There's a glucose protocol, there's keto, there's paleo, there's like so many different ways of eating. It's like, what truly doesn't mean or look like to have a healthy diet? Like, I want to know. Yeah, this is such a good question. You're right. It's a huge question, but it actually can be quite simple. So what I believe a healthy balanced diet is, is a real food diet where we're eating mostly real foods, mostly whole foods, um, but also allowing ourselves grace and not being 
to the point where we can be obsessive and getting orthorexic because I've also been there where I was obsessively healthy and I didn't have a healthy relationship with food at that time even though I thought I was doing all the right things to be healthy I was still I had a toxic relationship with food because of my obsession with only eating all the best things so um, it's really about finding that balance of eating real foods most of the time but also knowing that it's not the end of the world if you do have something processed or if you do have Mm. that takeaway meal that does not tick the real food criteria because our body's amazing it's going to be fine with that but what we do the majority of the time is what's really important and majority of the time those real foods are really going to support us because it's the way that our body was designed it's the way that our body has evolved to get a balance of the real foods not all this processed stuff and What I've really seen a pattern in, and I'm sure many others have seen a pattern in, but the more processed foods get introduced to the market and us as consumers, and the more that that's what we're eating, the more sick people are getting. Like there's a real correlation between the like food production and food processing and how processed our food is getting and how sick we are as a population. Mm. So I really think that when we like come back down to the basics and we go back to the real food or the whole foods, however you want to word it, that's where it's really beneficial for our health because that's also where the nutrients are. Like these days, the processed foods are fortified with vitamins and minerals because all of the um, actual vitamins and minerals that were originally in that food have been stripped because they're so processed. So rather than having to have foods with fortified vitamins and minerals, why not have the actual real foods that naturally contain those things in their natural form where it's got all of the different compounds and molecules and um, all the things that are going to work together in a symbiotic nature to support us the way that it was designed to. So it really comes back to that. And yes, there's different ways that can kind of look, but I do think it's like the absence of restriction as well. Like there's some Mm. really restrictive diets out there. Like let's take keto, for example, super high fat, super low fiber, low carbohydrate. That's not necessarily going to be supportive for our gut health because then if we're not getting enough fiber. How are you going to move those bowels? (laughs) Exactly. We're going to be constipated. So there's like, that's, restrictive it's another form of a diet um and there can be a time and a place for keto like it's been shown to have some good evidence showing in treating of like epilepsy and things like that however for the general population if we just generally want to have a healthy diet yes it can be great to have higher protein and higher fat content but we don't want to completely remove big like macronutrients it's called macronutrients because we need it in big quantities so okay that's what that meant (laughs) yeah yeah so macronutrient is we need it in big quantities and micronutrient we need them in small quantities so um, different nutrients like um, vitamins and minerals come under the micronutrient and they we need smaller quantities of those whereas the macronutrients that's our things like our protein our fats our carbohydrates and believe it or not Mm -hmm. fiber is under carbohydrates so anytime someone tells you to cut out carbs they're also telling you to cut out everything's carbs <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like veggies are carbs and veggies are so Literally, good stuff. Fruit, we get veggies, so many, everything. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, not feeling the need to remove entire food groups or macronutrients mm-hmm. because they all do have their place. It's about getting that balance of each of them and eating them together is often its most beneficial, especially yeah. when we're coming from that glucose perspective and mm-hmm. helping to balance out our blood sugar. If we're eating the carbs with some healthy fats and with some proteins, that's going to help slow the release of any of the sugars in the carbs. So it's all about that balance of how we're eating it. But ultimately, the real foods are going to be less processed and therefore less detrimental in the long term. Yeah. So could you go through again those like main macronutrients so we just like yeah. understand like yeah. are we incorporating all of this into our diet? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got protein, which is one that's often shouted from the rooftops and for the right reasons, because it is a really important macronutrient. It is the building block to so many different structures within our body, but also different um, molecules too. Like it helps to make different neurotransmitters and hormones and all of that. So protein is made up of amino acids and we're not going to have a chemistry lesson. So I'll leave it at that. (laughs) kind of like um, overlying description, but um, protein is super important for lots of different reasons. And we often eat enough. Yep. I I have a question about that. So what about protein powder? Is that recommended or not? Because yeah, I want to get your take on that. 
Yeah, so th there can be a time and place for protein powders. I personally recommend going for the whole food where possible. So getting like something like, depending on your diet as well. If you're following a vegetarian or vegan diet, you might need protein powders to help get that protein intake up. If you're following a general diet where you do eat things like meat and fish and seafood and dairy and all of that kind of stuff, you're going to be getting more protein. So it's easier to get from the real food source. When it comes to protein powders, there's a huge spectrum. So there's some that are going to be, yeah, amazing, have those. And there's others that just have the longest ingredients list and they look Full like sugar. Long enough. Yeah, sugar, fillers, artificial flavors, artificial sweeteners or natural flavors and sweeteners, which I also mm -hmm. am not a huge fan of, particularly those natural flavors. Yeah, okay. I'm interested yeah. in that because I don't have artificial, but I have some things that have natural, but I've heard it's like also such a broad thing that it's not necessarily good for you so is that true like you should probably try and avoid that yeah I recommend limiting it it is really hard okay. to completely cut natural it flavors is. out unless you eat like nothing from a packet um which exactly. is obviously possible as well but it's not the most convenient these days so yeah there's a lot of health products and the worst thing they have in there is the natural flavors so I say it's kind of a moderation thing like I'll still have natural flavors occasionally yeah. But it's not something I want as like an everyday kind of thing. Uh, me personally, oh my gosh. obviously everyone's I'm different. rethinking because <laughs> like I have this like really good hot chocolate thing at night and it has all these like adaptogens and like herbs in it, but then it does have natural flavors. Oh, damn. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Explain what they actually are. So artificial flavors and natural flavors, the origin is the difference. So mm. artificial flavors originate from artificial ingredients or ingredients that are synthetic and made in a lab, whereas yeah. natural flavors originate from a natural food. So it mm. might originate, let's take um, natural chocolate flavor, for example. It might originate from cacao, but it's been heavily, heavily processed and refined. And oftentimes okay. they'll put a whole bunch of other things in there. Like there's different... When we think about it, actually, let's explain it this way. A flavor isn't actually a food. So when you look yeah, at it, of in list, it's like <laughs> natural flavors. It's like, hold on, what food is that though? Like, yeah. yes, food gives us different flavors, but when they're saying flavor, it's very vague and it's more mm. of like the taste they're trying to create. And to create that taste, sometimes they'll use all sorts of different highly processed ingredients. So mm. flavors are kind of like the fragrance of the food world. So if you know anything oh. about fragrance being like an umbrella term. Endocrine disruptor, like, yeah. <laughs> so it's like essentially they're all umbrella terms, which means they yeah. could have any number of ingredients under it. It could, could be up to 100 different <gasps> foods that they're no. using to make this flavor. Like that's an extreme example. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like it says yeah. natural flavor, it looks so innocent. And it's like, yeah, but what's actually going into that? Because exactly. if that was actually just a real food, why aren't you just telling me what's in it? Like True. if it was with cacao, why not just tell me cacao or even cocoa exactly. if you go going for a more processed one? Well, that's the thing. My hot chocolate has like cacao and stuff, but then it also has yeah. natural flavor. Yeah. Um, so it makes sense. And then there's one I have that's like Rocky Road flavor. And I'm like, that's yeah. probably worse, but it tastes good. <laughs> yeah. Yum. <laughs> so, okay. Good to know. Yeah. But I like your take on like, don't be restrictive. And, you know, there's some things where we're not about cutting it out and eliminating it forever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Because yeah. it can awesome. be, if you try to get too fixated on never having any of these things, then it can lead us down the other direction and it can get really depressing because like looking at a lot of products, even a lot of amazing healthy products, they might not necessarily have every ingredient perfect. Like they might yeah. have those natural flavors. And it's like, oh, but I just want to eat that. It's like, mm. yeah, that's okay. We get to eat that sometimes too. It's just not yeah. the staple of our diet. Yeah, because it's like the stress of trying to restrict yourself is actually mm -hmm. impacting your digestion and your nervous system more really. than actually just flowing. Yeah, so, 100%. Yeah. Or even the guilt of being like, oh, no, yes. I ate that thing. I feel so guilty for it now. That guilt's going to be worse than the actual Because your digestion thing. isn't going to yeah. digest something that you feel guilty about. Yeah. Exactly. Probably not. I mean, I'm kind of just making that up, but also like our body reacts. Yeah, true though. Yeah. Because it's like putting us into that state of fight or flight or that mm. state of like survival where when we are in our survival states, digestion kind of goes on the back burner because our yes. body 
I need to survive right now. So I need to focus on this immediate danger. And our Mm. body doesn't know the difference, whether it's we've just eaten a cookie and we're feeling stressed about that or whether we're being chased by a tiger. It doesn't know the difference, unfortunately. (laughs) It's still survival. Yeah. (laughs) Like putting all of its resources into increasing all of our senses and our ability to be Mm. able to survive that situation, whether it's through escape or fighting or in some cases freeze and appease these days as well. But um it's putting all of its resources into that. So our digestion and our immune system are two of the first things that are kind of like, oh, they're not as urgent right now because if I'm about to die, then it doesn't matter if I digest my lunch or yeah. if I'm about to die, it doesn't matter if I get a cold because yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> mm, so, that's why they call it rest and digest. Exactly. So yeah. it's really important to like really relax our nervous system and Perfect. be in that state of rest and di- digest when we're Yeah. Eating. So that was another thing that I had on my list of many questions to ask yeah. you later, but I want to actually come back around to the macronutrients. Yeah. So you said protein and yeah. then um, what was the next one? Yeah. So with protein, I'll also just summarize some of the sources of that. So oh, I yes. think I briefly touched on some of them earlier as well, but we've got things like our meat, um, fish, seafood, dairy, beans so all things like lentils or any other legumes we've also got things like tempeh and tofu uh nuts and seeds have small amounts of protein as well protein powders another one of the tangents we went on so we get protein from all of those kinds of things and then we've also got carbohydrates so carbohydrates are they and there are some crossovers also because carbohydrates Mm -hmm. also include things like the beans and legumes i just mentioned so lentils beans they have some carbohydrates within them but then we've also got our starchy vegetables so things like potato pumpkin sweet potato they're all our starchy vegetables that are higher in carbohydrates but most veggies also do contain some carbs so you could even put all veggies under the carbohydrate category another reason why it's so important not to cut out carbs because we don't want to be cutting out such a beneficial food group which is vegetables and Mm. fruits so that's like our carbohydrates there it would also count as things that people typically think of as carbs things like bread or pasta or noodles and all of those kinds of things as well Um, and then we've got healthy fats so healthy fats are things that we find in like our oily fish also nuts and seeds have some level of healthy fats Um, avocado all of the different oils which I could go on a whole spiel about oils as well but (laughs) essentially the oils we want to incorporate are things like extra virgin olive oil or coconut oil or macadamia oil or avocado oil um, and steering clear of some of those vegetable oils because while they do contain fats (laughs) they're not quite the healthy fats Yeah, (laughs) perfect. I'm sure like, do you have an episode on your podcast of like oils if you don't do one? (laughs) Yeah, I should do one. Yeah. Yeah. Something I get asked about a lot. It's like, which oils should I have and shouldn't I have? And yeah, it's Mm -hmm. like to summarize the ones that are on like the tick list would be extra virgin olive oil, avocado oil, coconut oil, ghee and butter. I also put under that category because they're good to cook with. They're not technically Mm -hmm. an oil, but it's kind of similar sort of vibe. And then the oils we want to avoid are sunflower oil, safflower oil, canola oil, soybean oil, peanut oil, anything that says vegetable oil. (laughs) Yeah, the list is huge, but they're some of like the main offenders. Um, Yeah. But yeah, if it says like vegetable oil, essentially, it's a no-go, especially because vegetable oil, again, is one of those umbrella terms where it's not telling us which oil is in it. Sometimes they say the breakdown, maybe it's canola and sunflower or safflower or whichever one, but vegetable oils in general can be quite inflammatory for the body. So I do recommend avoiding those and going for the other ones on the tick list that I just mentioned. Perfect. That's a great summary. (laughs) Awesome. So any other macro... um, foods or nutrients that you're talking about yeah so they're the main ones the protein okay. carbs and fats Perfect. yeah awesome yeah. okay so that's uh, you were talking about eating like whole foods yep. so is that basically what you just described as like those would be what you would say are whole foods yeah so fruits veggies um good quality sources of protein like meat fish seafood dairy if you eat it um legumes so any lentils beans what else nuts seeds herbs spices it's all of those things in like the fresh produce section of the supermarket yeah. um, but also then some of those staples too so you can still have whole grains just the less refined the better um, and same with products made out of those foods it's not to say mm-hmm. that 
bread isn't a real food, for example, but we want to make sure our bread is made out of real foods. So is it highly refined um, and just like turned into something that resembles cardboard or is it a beautiful like sourdough that's using really nice grains um, and maybe yes. has some seeds through it, that kind of stuff. It's like the origin of it and like the closer to the real food it is, mm. the better. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so I kind of wanted to then do the opposite of that. What are foods that you recommend avoiding um, if you want to be healthy? And I know that, again, there are like so many, but what would you really recommend? Yeah, well, thankfully, we've already touched on one of the big ones, vegetable oils. I would yeah. recommend avoiding them um, just purely because they can be quite inflammatory. And there's so many other like better alternatives when it comes to the healthier oils. So it's like a really easy, quick swap that we can make. Um, highly refined foods. So that's a lot of foods. It's probably like 90% of the supermarket. Yeah. All the inside of the supermarket. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, things that are highly refined. So that could be anything from like a supermarket, like even certain supermarket health foods. Like, and I say that with quotation marks, um, for anyone that can see this visibly because it's like, they might be in the health food aisle, but they might not necessarily be healthy or it might be vegan, yeah. but they might not necessarily be healthy. Oh, like, so much vegan food. stuff, like all the vegan meat and it's like just full yeah. of crap, which totally. I used to eat that. Yeah, yeah, me too. I've been there as well. And it's like, it's all about what's it made of. So mm. when it comes to anything that we eat, I also recommend really looking at the ingredients list. So when we go to the supermarket, the best way to find the things to eat or not to eat is actually just getting to know what's in the foods that we're consuming. So looking at the ingredients list and asking that question, is this real food? Is this the kind of food that I would have at home in my pantry or my fridge? Could I make mm. this if I really wanted to? And obviously we don't have to make like it. Like make it from scratch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like could I make this like a muesli? Is this actually yeah. just like um, oats, nuts and seeds? Or True. have we got a whole bunch of other things in here and like chocolate chips and things that it's like probably not the best thing for breakfast if we want to stabilize yeah. our blood sugar level. Spike. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or like ingredients that you can't pronounce. Like yeah. that's a, like a big one of like, yeah, yeah, maybe I should steer away from that. Exactly. So yeah, really looking out for any foods that have any kind of like artificial flavors or artificial colors or artificial sweeteners. Um, so soft drinks would probably be another big group oh. of things that I'd say just like a no-go. So that's a nice There's so many one. good alternatives though. Like I have like sugar-free kombuchas. Like yeah, I'm exactly. sure those are, are good, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're much better than the soft drinks but we also do want to be careful of um not replacing soft drinks with a healthier alternative like yeah. kombucha is amazing and has some really beautiful benefits for our gut health but if we're consuming it in excess or oh, yeah. just replace one thing for another or it's not the best brand um, or mm. the best ingredients in there then we might think we're doing a really good job and then it's actually kind of going against what we're trying to do mm. so like yeah, the sugar free like, like diet coke yeah, like right? diet Coke, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So okay. Coke and Diet Coke, they've both got their pros and cons. Like I don't recommend either of them as like a regular thing. Obviously, it's kind of one of those things. If you want to have one occasionally, that's okay. There's obviously so many better options. My preference mm -hmm. would definitely be something like a kombucha instead of a Coke yeah. or a Diet Coke. Um, but again, it's like having that kind of like everything with a grain of salt. So if you still want mm -hmm. it occasionally... Just know that it's not the best thing for you, but don't feel guilty about it. Just be like, yeah. okay, this isn't a staple in my diet, so I'm just going to enjoy it every now and then because I still really love it, um, and that's okay. But don't be like, oh, you know what? I'm having a Diet Coke, so I'm going to have it every day because that means it's good for me because there's no sugar mm -hmm. because the artificial sweeteners are worse. Yeah, it's like yeah. the sugar and the artificial sweeteners, they're both not doing great things. So yeah. Yeah, soft drinks in general would be one of those categories. Um, and yeah, you're right. There's so many better things like kombucha, switchel in some places, even just like sparkling water or infusing mm. sparkling water with different things can be really nice. So um, yeah, there's no shortage of delicious tasting bubbly drinks. For sure. Um, I'm trying to think of some other like big broad categories like vegetable oil or like soft drinks because like I said, it's a lot of yeah. the well, well, My lot of things, because personally yeah. what I kind of like, avoid and again I'm not super strict and you've seen like what I eat but like I um try to limit like gluten dairy refined sugar those would be like my big three um what do you say about those because I even know then there's the nuance of like 
but like is like what type of dairy is it or like what yeah. type of gluten but what do you yeah. say on those because i like from what i've seen like they're inflammatory but um are they something we should limit or not really yeah, so this is a kind of like everyone's different and um, everyone's going to have their own individual requirements and needs. Uh, when it comes to gluten and stuff, what I've found is most people thrive without it. It's not mm. to say everybody, which is why it's such an individual thing, but majority of us probably could benefit, even if we're not completely gluten-free, going for way less gluten in our diet. Yeah. And that's because of a lot of like the production process and the way that a lot of these gluten pro the gluten foods have been created now. Like the wheat in our food now is very different to the wheat that yeah. our ancestors were eating, even in terms of what it's being sprayed with and glyphosate, which is something that we just don't want to be consuming a lot of. So, or any of ideally, but it's obviously <laughs> almost impossible to avoid entirely. So just being careful about that because it's not necessarily the grain. Like if you found some ancient wheat or ancient grains with gluten, that would probably be better than the conventional grains that are being used yeah, in those products that contain being gluten. it's been like genetically modified and changed. Yeah, a lot of the time it can be. Um, or Yeah, and the way it's just been produced to create more yield and just be more sturdy, like yeah, it's pretty toxic what's happened to it. And glyphosate is a, one of the worst pesticides, herbicides. I'm not sure which category exactly it feel, fall, feels under, but it's one of the things that um, food is being sprayed with. And I think wheat yeah. and corn are the main things that get sprayed with it. Okay. Um, so then organic, the would that be like they would avoid better. that if you purchase organic? Yeah, organic would okay. be a lot better. Um, then you've still got, so the organic gluten would be better than normal conventional gluten. Mm. Um, but in general, gluten has been found to be quite disruptive or inflammatory for our gut as well. So there's still mixed reviews out on this. And this is why I'm not like a hard and fast, no, it's terrible, get it out. Or yes, it's fine, keep it in. I'm kind of that in between. I know I thrive without gluten in my diet. And it doesn't mean I don't still have some sourdough when I go out to a cafe, but I don't mm. buy sourdough. I would buy like a gluten free sourdough instead um so it's like finding what works for us and what you'll notice as well and i'm sure you you're very familiar with this feeling of like the more you become in tune with your body and the more you become in tune with your food you'll notice which foods make you feel good yeah. and which don't like gluten might give you brain fog for me that can be one of the things i notice where i don't think as clearly or i don't feel as energetic like just noticing how we feel as individuals when we have different foods like some people might thrive off dairy and other people might be running to the bathroom <laughs> so yeah that like, used to be me yeah so it's like finding what's suitable for us um, and also the quality it's always coming back to that quality so like we've said awesome. even with the gluten debate it's like is it an organic um, gluten containing food or is it a mm -hmm. conventional gluten containing food because there's going to be a difference so yeah. that's kind of a little bit about gluten then when it comes to dairy again this one's kind of like it's the processing the, of dairy and the mm -hmm. health even of the cows that we're getting or the animals oh, yeah are they, they like really pumped with hormones are yeah. they grass-fed <laughs> Yeah. So we've kind of got like this sliding scale of like, if we want to incorporate dairy, the ones that are going to be best for us are the ones that are going to be the grass fed organic um, cattle, or it could even be um, goats or sheep that we're getting the dairy from. So it's about like the animal's health as well. And I think that's actually something really beautiful because the more we focus on our health, the more we're also focusing on the health of the whole ecosystem. Yes. It's like, okay, cool, I want the healthiest meat available. So I'm going to go for that grass fed organic beef rather than the factory farmed beef that was treated terribly, very unethical, never saw outside, was in a little cage its whole life. Like it actually helps us become more ethical and become more um, supportive to the entire ecosystem. So looking at the quality and therefore just adjusting accordingly too. Like some people might find like yourself that dairy is just a no-go. I used to think that dairy was a no-go for me. And then I kind of started eating raw dairy products, which technically is illegal in Australia, but you can find it. <laughs> I'm not giving away any sources. Yeah. <laughs> But when I have raw milk, it actually sits with me really well. And I find that that is like better for me and it's something I can incorporate. So yeah, there's obviously a whole conversation we could have around that. And it's probably not the time or place today, but it comes down to, again, the quality of the produce and the closer it is to its natural form. So 
that would kind of be my piece on dairy, really getting in tune with your body. Um, and if you choose to have dairy, go for the organic and grass fed. It doesn't have to be the raw variety. Obviously, that's do that with your own discretion, um, because even me recommending that, I wouldn't do that because of all the legal implications. Yeah. So it's up to different people what they want to choose. I choose to consume that. But yeah, everyone else, if you want pasteurized, then just go for full cream, um, grass fed and organic if possible, or as close to that as possible. So that would be the dairy. And then the sugar, this one's a whole thing as well. I feel like there's a, all conversations we could go so deep yeah. on. Um, but the sugar, it's all, again, it comes back to the source of the sugar. Like, is it a highly refined sugar? Like you mentioned specifically refined, which is a great distinction because there's the difference between added sugars and then also natural sugars. So for mm, example- Because fruit is like sugar. Yeah, fruit and veggies contain natural sugars. It doesn't make them bad. It doesn't mean all sugar is evil. We don't want to be eating too much sugar because we want to support our blood sugar levels, but we also can balance that out with things like our protein and fat when we're having balanced meals or balanced snacks. So when we're eating a lot of added sugar, that's where the issue lies, where it's lots of refined sugar particularly. So like white sugar or those highly refined ones are going to be worse than adding in the less refined sugars or the more naturally occurring sugars, like something like honey or maple syrup or even coconut sugar. It's still technically a refined sugar, but mm. it's kind of got more of those um, vitamins and minerals within it. And we just want to make sure we're having it in smaller quantities and yeah. balanced with the other macronutrients. So it's supporting our steady blood sugar release. Perfect. So that's kind of what I would say about that. Yeah. That's amazing. So what about, um, cause personally for me, I have like erythritol and stevia or monk fruit sweetener. Would those be like yeah. better alternatives as well to like normal refined sugar? Yeah. So the jury's still out on those ones as well, just purely because things like erythritol in particular, um, and monk fruit is often a high percentage of erythritol. It can actually be a yeah, little bit of is. marketing. <laughs> yeah. I've noticed that some companies sell like 99%. It's like 99%. Percent yeah. And <laughs> monk fruit is like <laughs> cheeky. <laughs> Mm. so with erythritol in particular that one can be a digestive disruptor so it can okay I didn't know that yeah so it can cause discomfort bloating or laxative effect particularly Mm. in large quantities so it's going to generally be fine in small quantities but you do want to be mindful not to have it in huge quantities and again just to be in tune with your body so you're very in tune with your body you'll know if something like that's off and now you can make that connection if it's around when you had the erythritol some people are completely fine others find that doesn't agree with them at all again it's highly individual and because it's a relatively new ingredient there's not a lot of like long-term research or data so like I said the jury is still out Um, but in terms of a blood sugar perspective it does have um, a different impact on our blood sugar levels so it's not Mm -hmm. causing that blood sugar spike like with the sugar that can then lead to the blood sugar crash where we start to crave sweet things or we start to get hangry or irritable or um, yeah we just need that next fix (laughs) like yeah (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. I learned about the glucose like method protocol, whatever you call it, like um, at the beginning of this year and it completely changed the way that I look at things and eat. And I think I went into it a little bit again from that like restrictive thing. I noticed myself, like I've got to like cling to a certain way of eating and I'm like, no, okay, got to relax. I can have something sweet a little bit without eating protein or something it's okay I'm not gonna die yeah. Exactly. But yeah 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 coming back awesome. to like what we do most of the time not all the time mm. like it's the majority that matters and those other times we're gonna be fine <laughs> perfect I have another quick question for you um what are your thoughts on fasting yeah so fasting for females is not actually recommended. So if we're looking at the hormonal health, the health of our hormones, and from that perspective, a lot of fasting studies are actually done on men. So yes, I've heard that. Yeah. And in men, amazing results. Like we hear so much good stuff about fasting and that's because it can be true, but it's often in men, not in women. So when it comes to women, because we actually have a completely different cycle to males who just have their circadian rhythm, their 24 hour cycle, we also function off a circadian rhythm, but we function off an infradian rhythm as Mm -hmm. well, which is essentially our menstrual cycle. And that 28 ish day, I'll say ish because it does vary. The textbook um, menstrual cycle is 28 days, but based on individuals, it might be shorter, might be longer. 
So because we also have that whole cycle to factor in, when it comes to fasting, different times of our cycle, it can actually be really detrimental to be fasting. So it's not recommended for women unless you're beyond menopause, in which case um, the infradian cycle has changed and we've kind of got yeah. like a different rhythm. Um, and then it can, can be beneficial. I don't know if there's been a lot of research or studies done in postmenopausal women and fasting. But in terms of anyone premenopausal that's a female, um, it's not recommended to do intermittent fasting. There can be times and places if you want to do the occasional like um, three day fast or you want to do the occasional water, one day water fast or you want to fast for 12 hours a day because you want to finish your dinner at seven and eat at seven in the morning. That sort of stuff's fine. It's just going over that, going to that 16, eight or what's that one that's like um, five, two, where five of the days you eat what you want and then two of the days you're highly restrictive. It's also not encouraging a healthy relationship with no. food, um, particularly the five, two or those kind of things. I know the 16, eight can be done in a healthy way. And the 16, eight to clarify what that is, is 16 hours of fasting and eight hours of eating, which is the most common type of intermittent fasting. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't recommend those in women, something like a 12 mm. hour fast, like I said, absolutely fine because we're going to be asleep for hopefully at least eight hours of those yeah. and then we want a little bit of buffer time e either side, but beyond that, it wouldn't be recommended purely for the health of our hormones. Perfect. Oh, mm. I love that. Cause I feel like not a lot of people are talking about it from that like view of the yeah. female cycle. And it's so important to recognize cause they ha like, I don't remember the year, but there's like, prior to a certain year, which wasn't long ago, they basically just all did the studies on men and like didn't include yeah. women because we were too um, unpredictable with our cycles. But it's like, isn't that the totally. point? Like, Why you need to exactly. include us? Yeah, it's so important. Yeah. yeah. And I think something that doesn't get talked a lot with fasting as well is if we're eating for less hours, we're not necessarily eating as much food. And while in some mm. cases that can be good for people who are prone to overeat, we also want to make sure we're getting enough nutrients throughout the day. And oftentimes when we're eating these real foods and having these balanced meals, we're less likely to overeat because we're actually going to be satisfied. We're actually going to be yes. full. We're going to be getting the protein. We're going to be getting the fats. We're going to be getting the carbs and the fiber within the carbs. So we feel fuller and we don't need to eat as much. So if we're fasting and we're restricting that, let's say we're only having two meals a day and they're just kind of average size, maybe we're actually not getting enough calories to even meet our basal metabolic rate, which is the amount yeah. of calories we need just to function as humans. And then you're alone. working out on top of that. <laughs> exactly. Like I often find a lot of people think they're eating too much, but they're actually not even eating enough. So mm -hmm. we've gone so far into diet culture and restriction and crazy like 1200 calorie diets and things that we've actually oh like not eating enough in some cases, or we're not eating enough of the right foods. So yeah. maybe we're eating too much of the more processed foods and that's why we're not feeling satisfied. We're needing more because a lot of the nutrients are lacking. So we find ourselves overeating and then we can end up eating too much. But when it comes to fasting, it's kind of, it may prevent some of that excessive snacking and it can support people if they're in that place where they're just finding they're snacking all the time. But when they're fasting, they know they don't over snack and things. But in general, I'd say we really want to make sure we are getting enough food and fasting can be something that gets in the way of that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. good to know. So when it comes to like, you know, our hormones and our cycle, Yep. What is like, do you have some tips on like eating that's going to help with our hormones and should we like eat differently based on different times in our cycle? Like, do you have any recommendations on that? Yeah. So this is like, there's a lot that could be said around this as well. Some of the main things I would actually say before we even talk about food for optimizing our cycle would be around the decreasing stress because that's really yeah. going to support our hormones and hormone production and all of our systems. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a really important one. And even like removing endocrine disruptive things from our environment. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So like everything, all the yeah. chemicals. <laughs> Yeah, all the chemicals, they're out. So switching to natural cleaning products, natural skincare, natural beauty products, all of that kind of stuff can be really beneficial in general for our hormonal health. Um, also not heating our food in plastic and trying to avoid eating oh, out of plastic. The BTAs. 
yeah, particularly heating food in plastic um, or drinking water out of plastic bottles, trying to switch to glass or stainless steel um, is going to be a lot more beneficial because we're getting less of the plastic. And plastic essentially has xenoestrogens in them, which can then disrupt our normal estrogen production. Mm. So they'd be kind of some of my overlying tips in terms of the way we would eat throughout our cycle. What we're going to find is we often are looking for more like warm, comforting kind of foods when we are menstruating. Um, And it doesn't mean we have to head down to the takeaway shop or get some like comfort food in quotation marks. It could even just be having a really beautiful slow cooked meal or more of those kind of like wintery style ones. Exactly. Like a roast, a stew, a curry, like those kind of things can be really nice and nurturing and warming in those times where we do crave more of that comfort. Um, and one of the beautiful things about cooked foods is it actually is already partially digested. So when it comes to hormonal health, menstruating, and when we're like looking for just easier to digest things or more comforting things, it also can be really beneficial in general for anyone that has, um, a more sensitive gut. You might find that cooking more of your foods for a time can be beneficial to really be more gentle and nurturing on the gut. And there's many things we can do for gut healing in general, but I just wanted to throw that in while we were talking about those kind of like slow cooked foods when we're menstruating. Um, So when we're menstruating, I'm sure many of your listeners have also heard of the menstrual cycle referred to as the seasons. Um, Mm -hmm. And when we're menstruating, that's often referred to as our winter. So it's kind of fitting that it's like those comforting winter kind of foods that we're looking for. Same goes for when we're ovulating. So in the middle of our cycle, we might notice we want more fresh foods and salads and like those raw foods actually feel really good. That's because we're in our internal summer. So it Mm -hmm. often aligns with our, um, yeah, with the the seasons um, and where we are in our cycle and what kind of foods we're going to crave or what kind of foods are going to be more supportive for our body. Um, And just listening to that, getting to know that, I really recommend everyone gets to know their own body and what feels good for them. It's such a game changer and so important on this path of like personal development and just being empowered in general. Um, Because when we know where we are in our cycle, we can tailor food, exercise, work, like all of these things around it to really optimize how we feel um, and our energy levels and productivity and all of that kind of stuff. So they'd kind of be some of the overlying themes. And in order to eat seasonally, within our cycle, I think it's also important to learn about seasonal eating in general. So learning about what's in season when, um, what kind of foods are best for the body in different seasons, which is pretty easy. It's like in cold months, we want warm foods. In hot months, we want raw foods and cold foods. So following kind of that system as well. Perfect. Awesome. So I have a quick question on... um, on how to eat and stay healthy if you feel like you don't have a lot of time. Because I feel like a lot of people see it as like a chore, like I have to cook, I have to organize my meals, like it's so much easier to get takeout or get Uber Eats and like developing that like positive relationship with like nourishing yourself. How can people include that where they just feel like, oh, it's such like a burden in order to eat healthy? Yeah. One of the best things for this would be to just batch cook things, like organize That's what you're going to go. <laughs> yeah. It's the best, isn't it? It's like, cool, yeah. I'm just making up a giant slow cooker full of food and I'm going to eat this for five days. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the nutrition and health space, we are big advocates of incorporating a lot of variety and variety is important for our gut, but we don't have to take it so literally that it means we have to eat a different meal every meal. Like we can actually incorporate variety by one, including lots of ingredients in the meal that we are going to repeat throughout the week or two, by just alternating the meals. So maybe let's say this week I made a uh, roast and then had lots of roast veggies. Maybe next week my thing might be a curry with like different types of vegetables and a different type of meat. So it's like getting variety there. It may not all be across the same week and we do want to aim for at least 30 plant-based foods in one week um, for that variety and that gut health. But we can do that throughout like by the time we eat even just a couple of meals I find when you're eating real food as well and incorporating lots of herbs and spices or even adding some nuts and seeds to different things the number gets up there pretty quick so ultimately just batch cooking and using your time wisely so putting something together that's going to last you multiple meals or if you still want to cook maybe just cook like once a night and make enough for leftovers the next day for you and your family so it's still like you're taking out having to cook your lunch as well or having to prepare something separate for lunch 
just kind of using leftovers to your advantage to take some of that time out of it and make it easier for ourselves because it can be a lot of work if we want to have different meals every meal and incorporate all this variety and like tick all these boxes and try all these different things and all those TikTok recipes or Instagram Mm. recipes that we see that look great it can feel really overwhelming but just bringing it back to basics and using things like batch cooking and being really organized so things like meal planning and meal prep um, and just going and getting your groceries can be such a time saver in the long run because even though it might take a couple of hours out of your weekend it's saving you so much time throughout the week yeah for sure that's what i do every weekend i have one day where i go to the market i get all my food and my supplies i make a day of it and then i come back and i cook like one or two things for the rest of the week and i actually really enjoy it now a couple years ago i was like i'm not a good cook i don't like it it feels like a chore but once you really get into the rhythm of it you realize like how special it is that you get to just nourish yourself and be part of the whole entire journey of like getting food from the market onto your plate it like feels so good it's actually so therapeutic for me now and I feel like so in my feminine that I get to just do this and there's no like like end goal like yeah okay the the result is the food but it's not like I'm just cooking for the end result like it actually gets to be this whole experience and guys you can change that because I used to hate cooking and now I love it absolutely and I love the way you even worded that you get to do it rather than you have to because so often we're yeah. like, I have to eat healthy. And yeah, I've been I there. I love it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's like when we can change our whole relationship to nourishing our body and to cooking and to food, that can be really beautiful because then it's like we start to get excited about it. We start to uh, like take that time out of our weekend. And you can make it social also. Something I love doing is like meeting up with a friend at the market and like doing our grocery shop and then parting yeah. ways and coming home and doing my meal prep. Like, so you can incorporate other things that might be on the to-do list, like catch up with friends or family Mm -hmm. you can actually make that part of the process too for sure yeah teaming up with people and yeah getting all your girlfriends together having a market day it's like so cute I love it go to the farmer's market and I always get some some snacks and food while I'm there oh so good so good it is awesome okay I feel like we need to go on to um, talking about nervous system and stress and the trauma and everything behind food because we kind of talked about, okay, what do we eat? But um, first thing I want to talk about, which you mentioned earlier, is like digestion. What are some things that you do to help improve digestion or stimulate digestion on like an energetic level, on like a nervous system level to help that because like you could be eating the best foods but Mm -hmm. if you're eating and you're stressed or you're eating really fast or you're eating watching tv like I know those things are going to really inhibit your digestion so there are a few things that I do I want to hear from you like how can we actually make sure we absorb and digest our food properly Yes, I love this question. And I love that you're so onto it with making sure your nervous system is regulated when you're eating because it is so important and not something to be underestimated. Like so often, like you said, people are eating all the right foods, but they're still so highly stressed eating it and it's not going to have the same benefits. So one of the best things we can do is just incorporate mindful eating. One of the best Mm. things for that is to breathe before you eat, like take a few big, deep breaths. One of the best ways to regulate our nervous system. Yeah, seriously. Like literally just sitting there and taking a few deep breaths before you eat your food. It will help you slow down. It will put your nervous system back into that rest and digest state or help get it in that direction at least. And it will mean you'll be able to get more out of that food. So breath is one of the best things we can do. And the more mindful we can be throughout the whole meal and the more we can focus on our breath throughout the whole meal, the better it is going to be. But even just those few breaths beforehand can be a game changer. So creating that as like a habit, I would highly recommend. Um, And then trying to engage your senses when you're eating as well and trying to really be in the moment and almost make it like an eating um, mindfulness practice. Like I would say meditation, but that's kind of its own category. Mm. It's more of that mindfulness practice where it's like, how does this taste? What's the texture like? How does it smell? Um, How does it feel? Like all of the different senses, bring them in. 
uh, look at the colors, like really enjoy your food, eat with your eyes as well, and really be present with your food. Because when we're in the present moment, it helps our body feel more safe and stop thinking about all the thousand things on our to-do list that can put us back in survival. So really just making it a really mindful practice. And you mentioned like not watching TV while you eat and like trying to minimize distractions while we eat is going to be really beneficial. So try to avoid scrolling on your phone or watching something in the background and just try and be present with the food um, or with the people that you're eating the food with. Yeah, I love it because it's like it can become a pleasure practice as well as like getting into your feminine, which is about the senses. And it's like, yes. can you eat your food like sensually? Like, can you be like the food yes. goddess? Like embody your inner goddess and like make yes. out with like your food, like your fruit and like take it to the next level of like just that whole um, embodiment. It just really changes it so much and gets us deeper into our senses. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Getting that feminine receive, really receive. Mm. Receive yeah. the nourishment and through yeah. the senses. And then yeah. if you're in receiving mode, I guess your body, that's what digestion is. It's like receiving the nourishment from yeah. the food. So it makes sense, totally. which in kinesiology, when people are experiencing like bloating and digestive problems, what we say is like the energetic cause is like you're not digesting life. Like if you can't digest life, then then it's going to mean you can't digest your food. You can't process. So yeah, it's like so much into that. And so I want to dive deeper into, okay, like it's so easy to be like, just eat this and don't eat that and eat whole. But then a lot of us use food as like a coping mechanism or our relationship with food reflects our relationship with ourselves. Um, you know, you, so many people when we're stressed or depressed, we go to food, we binge eat, we don't eat. Like food has not just become, okay, a way of nourishing and nurturing ourselves, but food has also become this whole entire relationship, this whole entire um, like mentality around it, especially with the food industry as well. Um, all yeah. these ads and, and people like, you know, just feed your kids whatever they want so they'll be happy. I know my grandparents, <laughs> Parents did that to me like there's this whole entire other energetic thing around food so I kind of want to talk about like what are the main issues we can see and how is like energetics and trauma related to food and why do you need to clear that then in order to eat healthy because you can be trying your hardest having the willpower to eat healthy but if you've got all these eating habits that are related to like you know, inner distress and like trying to soothe yourself through food, emotional eating, it's going to be really hard to break the pattern. So it's not just like blaming and shaming people. Like it's just easy, like eat healthy. It's actually like looking at the root. And that's essentially what you do. You, you yeah. tell people and show them how to eat healthy. But then you also bring in like, why are we struggling with food or, or eating addiction? So I'd love for you to share more mm. on that. Yeah, I love this topic because it is, it's so true. So many people are knowing what to do and struggling to do it and then beating themselves up about it. And I've been there too in the past, like being like, I know what I need to eat. Why can't I eat it? Or why do I still have this unhealthy relationship with food? And it's literally just, as you said, our body is trying to protect us. It's a protection mechanism and it's trying to distract us from the underlying emotions. And this is why emotional health is such an important piece of the health puzzle, because if we're not addressing our emotions and we've got all of this underlying emotional distress or we're feeling um, stressed out or overwhelmed or we've got a bunch of trauma that we haven't like processed and moved out of our body, then that's all going to be stuff that our body's trying to distract us from. Because the main reasons that we emotionally eat, there's two main reasons that I've found one is as a distraction because we don't want to feel that emotion that's coming up for us. So we turn to food to comfort us and provide that temporary relief or to fill a void. So if we feel like something's missing in our life, we feel like um, we're lacking something or we're not happy in our job or we're longing for the partner of our dreams or whatever it may be, if there's some sort of void, people can turn to food to try and fill that void um, because food is literally filling us up, right? So it yeah. kind of makes sense on one level, but unfortunately it's not addressing what's actually feeling like it's missing. No. Um, and it could so, also be the opposite, right? Of I know for me, like I had an eating disorder and it was like my emotional things of like then restricting myself and punishing myself by not mm -hmm. eating when I was younger. And then when mm -hmm. I'm stressed, I'm like most people, I feel like they say when I'm stressed, I like eat excess. Like when I'm stressed, I don't want to eat. Like it's yeah. the opposite. 
And this is a really interesting one. So this is because when we feel out of control in our life, we control the one thing we feel like we can control, yeah. which is the food. So we're like, yeah, if things in our life are overwhelming or hectic or chaotic, or we feel like we don't have control, we're like, all right, what can I control? And we fixate mm-hmm. on that. And most often it's food because it's such a big part of our life. Like we eat three yeah. times a day more if we're snacking. Like, so it's that element of control and feeling like I need to be able to control something. So I'm just Mm -hmm. going to not eat because I can control that. And often you can lose your appetite as well, because if you are in hardcore survival mode, yeah, your body is like, I don't need food right now. I just need to survive. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Because I'm like, when I'm like emotionally stressed, I'm like, I don't have an appetite. Like I don't want to (laughs) eat. I can't relate yeah. to people saying they're stressed and they want to eat. I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it can go either way. So it's still a form of like, you're still in that survival and it's still those mm. that underlying emotion that needs to be addressed. So whether it's the stress or the overwhelm or whatever it may be for the person that's coming up for, um, but it's still, yeah, it's all coming back to the emotional health and like that deeper layer of health. Cause when we think of health, we often think of the physical things we can do, like eating healthy yeah. and moving our body, drinking the water, getting enough sleep, those kinds of things. But we really also want to be looking at any underlying emotion. And this is one of the reasons I love kinesiology so much. One of the reasons we yes. get along so well, <laughs> because if we don't deal with our emotional health and what's going on in our body and communicate with our body and really get to know our body well, then we can be trying our hardest and there's just other things and our body is just trying to protect us it's like no like I don't feel safe allowing you to feel this so let's go distract ourselves with food go on and then it becomes a habit so this is where it also gets even trickier because we've got this habit of emotional eating or this habit of going to the pantry when we're feeling sad or depressed and it's also ingrained in us like if you watch any movie where someone breaks up they're on the couch with a tub yeah. of ice cream like, literally <laughs> It's It's the ice cream or it's a bottle of wine. It's like there's some way that they're distracting themselves from feeling Mm. that emotion. Um, And therefore, we're not being taught. It's like if you're feeling that emotion, actually just have a really good cry or punch a pillow or Mm. like talk to a friend about it or journal or do some breath work or whatever you need in that moment. We're not shown that. We're not modeled that. It's like conditioned in us that it's like, oh, you had a breakup, you're sad, go for the ice cream in the freezer. Binge yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's also that element of conditioning and also the element of it becoming a habit then because if mm. we're one of those people like myself who if I feel stressed or overwhelmed, I can turn to emotional eating or I was much more prone to, now I'm much less likely to. But you're on the other side of the spectrum where you're like, no, nah, I don't want to eat. So it's a different kind of thing that you're battling with. But for those that do get drawn to emotional eating or food when they're distracting themselves from an emotion, it's really just about building that relationship with our emotions um, and being able to process and move through them and move it from the body. Because I'm sure you talk about a lot how emotions are just energy in motion. They just yes. need to move. They just need to get out. Um, and the more we just stuff them down with food or by ignoring them, the more they're just going to stay in there and fester. And eventually it'll lead to some sort of eruption or some sort of issue that forces us to address it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then that's where also all the symptoms and things come up from the the eating and, and being healthy just means, you know, being able to come back into our natural state. Like people think like bloating and constipation and acne is like also normal, but it's because, yeah, we're just so dysregulated in our stress, in our diet. And I love how you address all those different parts. And you also have a um, training on emotional eating as well. Yeah, yeah, which does teach some of those core reasons um, of why we emotional eat that we've just chatted through and like how to identify when we're emotional eating because sometimes depending on how often you do it or where you're at with your relationship with food you can find yourself at the pantry eating and before you've even noticed you can already have eaten a whole bag of chips or a whole block of chocolate or whatever your go-to food is so even just the simple act of identifying the difference between true hunger and emotional hunger can be really supportive and I'm happy to summarize that here now which True hunger is it comes on over a period of time. So it's like we've had breakfast. It's been a few hours. We're starting to get hungry again. We're like, yep, it's about lunchtime now. It makes sense. 
Whereas emotional hunger, it comes along really quickly and irrationally. It'll just come out of the blue. Like you might even have just eaten a meal and you're like, I just really need to eat something salty or I just really need that bag of lollies right now. It's like very irrational. Um, And it's often for a particular type of food. So it might be sweets, it might be salty, it might be this particular chocolate. Whereas normal hunger, true hunger, you're happy to eat whatever you've got available to you because it's like you're not in any kind of irrational rush to eat the food. Mm. Um, So they're two of the main ways to identify it. And then also just the feeling of fullness that comes when you are truly hungry and you eat, you generally feel satisfied and full. Whereas when you're emotionally hungry, even if you're eating, even if you're feeling like physically full, like you're about to burst, you still don't feel satisfied because you're not eating from the place of actual hunger. You're eating from the place of trying to distract yourself from the emotion. Yeah. It's like you're trying to fill not the physical void you have, but the energetic Mm. one. And obviously food's never going to fill the energetic void you have so you'll never feel satisfied yeah. like that makes exactly. sense yeah exactly yeah so, yeah it's a big Amazing. thing but ultimately like you said it comes back to really supporting our nervous system and really um getting in touch with that and really regulating our nervous system and also healing our relationship with our emotions and just actually processing and feeling them yeah so that's essentially what you do with your clients is helping them in this full approach of what we talked about today right so yeah. um the the whole food eating and then the nervous system regulation the rest and digest and then um reducing the emotional eating and the trauma is there anything else that you feel like we've kind of missed out on or not touched on in this episode that you want to touch on Oh, I feel like we've covered some amazing topics here um, yeah. and we've gone over a lot. I feel like, yeah, I feel pretty complete with that. I feel like we've covered some really big poignant things. Um, mm. Yeah. And there's a lot of like, even just going back and listening to this episode, I reckon would be so beneficial because there was oh, yeah. a lot that we kind of packed in. You need to take down notes. Like I want to re-listen yeah. and like take yeah. notes. Yeah, I'm going to re-listen episode. to this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Awesome. I feel like I want to end with you diving a little bit um, deeper into what we talked about of like, again, it's not just what it is you're eating, but the energy of when you're eating and you can be eating all the right foods, but then feeling restrictive and guilty or like, you know, all that. So overall, it's like, how can we maintain this positive way of being while eating um food and not being too restrictive in a way that's like serving us yeah love this so essentially our relationship with food is a reflection of our relationship to ourself and our relationship to ourself is a reflection of all of our relationships in life whether it's to people or things like food is a thing it's not a person but we still have a relationship with food so when we're looking at anything to do with our relationship to food or how we're approaching food which is what i mean by relationship to food whether it's through restriction or whether it's through um binging or just complete freedom that reflects our relationship Relationship to ourselves. So if there's something in disharmony within our relationship to food, we need to look inwards and start to reflect on that. So like we were talking about earlier, maybe we're overly controlling with our food. Where do we feel out of control with the rest of our life? And how can we like be okay with that part of us and really just like have that self-trust to know that we can get through anything um, and just building that relationship to ourselves so we feel okay being out of control or living more from the heart instead of the head. So it really comes back to self-love, I think, ultimately, is a huge piece here. Um, And it's such like a foundational thing we need for health, but also for like happiness in any area of our life. Because if we're doing things, whether it's food or business from a place of like wanting to change ourselves or um, feeling like we need more money because we're not good enough as we are, we're Mm. ultimately seeking how we think that thing is going to make us feel. So maybe we're on a weight loss journey and we're like, we have this restrictive relationship with food because we think that when we lose weight, then we're going to feel pretty enough or good enough or beautiful or important or sexy. But actually we can start feeling like that now. And that's why we have to look inward and heal that relationship with ourselves and be like, okay, so if I felt that way, if I felt beautiful and sexy and enough, how would I treat myself? How would I act? How can I cultivate that within me now and know yeah, that how I would I eat? Change? Yeah from that space how would I eat so and knowing that we don't have to change that we're amazing as we are and often the more we learn to love ourselves and the more we really heal that relationship to ourselves 
the more everything else falls into place because we treat ourselves with so much respect and reverence and we do nourish our body because we love ourselves and we move our body because we love ourselves and we um, go after our dreams because we know we deserve them and we feel worthy and we know we're enough like so it really comes back to that loving of ourselves and turning inwards and that's why the emotional work is so important it's why the mindset work is so important um, and really turning that mirror with back on ourselves and looking at where maybe something within ourselves is in disharmony yeah that is beautiful I feel like this is just the perfect way to end this podcast it's like looking at your eating habits overall do you eat and fuel your fuel yourself because you love yourself or do you eat because you're trying you're in lack and you're trying to get somewhere or you're unhappy and and that's really going to impact how you digest food and and how you receive it um ultimately not just what you eat so it's a combination of all of it which i feel like we covered in depth today so thank you so much shana for being here and just giving people such incredible valuable tips and information i know even for myself i actually have learned so much today Um, even though I am so into health there's still so much to explore and learn so where can people find you if they want to go deeper into your world and if they want to work with you yeah so my website is www.shanasarpi.com so that's s-h-a-h-n-a-s-a-r-p-i and my Instagram handle is at Shana Sarpi. So I post there most of my offerings and everything that's going on in my world and lots of helpful tips and resources. Um, and any of the other ways to work with me will be available on my website as well. Perfect. I'll link all of Shana's details in the show notes. If you want to go check her out, definitely recommend that. Thank you again for coming on here. This was such a beautiful, heartfelt conversation and excited for more as always. So thank you all for listening and we will see you next time. Thanks so much for having me, Katie. Thank you. That was so fun.